Bank robbing samurais, giant killer whales, and glorious golden boners. Golden Kamui gets weirder with every single episode. Hello my friends, I've returned for another double dose of Golden Kamui episodes. I'm going to be looking at two episodes today because I have been incredibly busy at work, I've been doing a lot of traveling, and that's why I'm looking at two episodes today. And honestly, I really like it this way because the last couple of episodes rounded up the arc all about Nihei Tetsuzo, the crazy bear hunter, and now we're going to move on to another brand new prisoner from Abishari Prison, a man who goes by the name of Henmi, and Henmi is kind of a psychopath. That's right, the grand introduction of Henmi Kazuo, who is another prisoner from Abashiri, who is a crazy, murderous serial killer. And his entire shtick is that he seems to get off on fantasizing about his ultimate demise, his very own death. And that's because he's completely obsessed with the concept of death ever since he was a young child, witnessing his younger brother being literally torn apart and eaten by a massive boar in the forest. He's been desperately trying to capture that feeling, the feeling of the ultimate feel of the kill. And he hopes that he's going to go out in the blaze of glory. We get the skinny on Henmi Kazuo from Shiraishi Yoshitake, who apparently was one of his former cellmates. And he actually just barely escapes running away from Ushiyama. That's actually how the last episode ended, with Ushiyama juggernauting his way through the, the city streets. And he ends up running into the 7th Division, which causes a little bit of conflict, and a big shootout ensues. That's actually the main focus of the 8th episode of the series, is following up what happened to Shiraisi as he was running away from Ushiyama, and getting to see this big giant bank robbery that Hijikata's group was actually undertaking, not just to get money and funds for their ensuing coup and war, but also to steal some sort of very rare samurai sword. I'm not really sure the meaning behind it, but it looks really awesome, and it also gives us our first confrontation between Hijikata and Lieutenant Surumi. These characters don't even really talk to each other at all, but it's such just a clash of the titans here. I believe it's what the Joker said in The Dark Knight, what happens when an immovable force meets an unstoppable object. It's just awesome, and I love that we have all of these different factions which are going to do everything in their power to find these prisoners, skin them alive, and find the gold. It just sort of intensifies everything. But the rest of the eighth episode is a formal introduction to the character of Henmi Kazuo, who is the serial killer who's been going around the mountains and killing people much to his very own delight, as well as trying to find the ultimate demise for himself. And he ends up finding that in the form of Sugimoto. And this leads to one of the most disturbing and also hilarious parts about these episodes right here. We get to learn that whenever Henmi is actually talking about his very own death, he starts to get a raging boner about it. And this is actually illustrated by this golden light, which seems to constantly be emanating from his pants. But the way that they frame all of this is almost in a very over-the-top comedic fashion, with his ridiculous expressions of love and admiration for everything killing. It's funny, but also it kind of creeps you out at the same time. Without a doubt, it makes him one of the most memorable characters I've seen from the entire series. And I find that as Golden Kamui goes on, it just gets progressively stranger with every single new character who is introduced. And episode 9 is where things don't necessarily jump the shark, they kind of jump the whale. There's this whole subplot where Sugimoto and Asirpa and Shiraishi are desperately trying to find Henmi. They want to bring him to justice, and of course they want to get those skins. And thanks to some convenient timing, Sugimoto learns from Asirpa that her clan is actually down by the ocean, and they're hunting whales. This is all really disturbing if you're a big fan of whales in general, and you think that harvesting them for food is kind of messed up, which is still kind of a controversial thing in Japan. Again, this is a period piece, and you have to accept it for truly what it is. Is. And if you want to make it a little easier to swallow, just imagine that every single time they're throwing spears at the whales, they're just saying, Fuck you, dolphin! Fuck you, whale! If you don't get that reference, it's from an amazing episode of South Park. Eventually, they learn that Henmi is actually amongst these fishermen, and they end up meeting him formally. And when Henmi actually realizes that this is the amazing immortal Sugimoto, he does everything.
everything in his power to make sure that Sugimoto is going to be the one that kills him, which leads to a lot of really funny and super awkward scenes. You see, when they meet Henmi for the very first time, he actually almost drowns in the water and they end up saving him, and he has to warm his body so that he doesn't die of hyperthermia, but if he does this, he actually risks showing the tattoos to everyone, so he covers himself in a blanket. But while he's doing this, he opens it up, fanning himself and warming himself up with the big glowing boner coming up. In this moment, he realizes Sugimoto will be the one to kill me. He goes on to fantasize about the various ways that he's going to do it, but eventually they realize they're about to be captured by the 7th Division, so he retreats with Sugimoto up to this massive mansion where his leader is actually going to be hanging out. They end up running into some other soldiers there, and Henmi just starts going on the rampage, killing them, decapitating one guy, and stabbing a guy through the face, and even getting up on it for the fact that this guy is desperately struggling to survive. This is all connected, of course, to his weird obsession with his brother's death, but it still paints him as kind of a weird and creepy pervert, especially when he ends up landing in Sugimoto's arms and they end up running away. When they meet up with Shiraishi, he realizes that, yeah, that's Henmi Kazuo, and he decides to go on the attack, where Sugimoto promptly stabs him multiple times and even proceeds to stab him in the heart. And I'm like, wow, that's how they're going to end this. This is... Pretty strange and not exactly what I was expecting. When suddenly a massive killer whale jumps up from the ocean, grabs onto Henmi and drags him into the water. So now they go on this desperate chase to try and kill this whale so that it doesn't swallow this guy alive and they'll lose one of the tattooed skins. It's at this moment that things honestly just got kind of wacky in Looney Tunes to the point where I found myself laughing at all of the craziness. What makes the scene incredibly awesome, however, is that Henmi is just delighted by all of these events. Being killed by Sugimoto, stabbed through the heart, now being mauled to death by a massive creature and drowned in the water. It's the ultimate over-the-top death. It's like Mickey Rourke stepping on top of a landmine and being attacked by a tiger at the same time. If you know what movie that's from, you win the internet. Episode 9 ends with a great cliffhanger where we go back to the story of Tanagaki, who's still recovering from his wounds in Aserpa's village. Uh, when he actually returns, uh, he finds out that we get to see the return of Ogata. Yes, he has returned, and he has actually managed to develop a little more personality than we saw the last time. And this scene is especially intense, as it seems like om almost any moment they're actually going to try to kill him and maybe even Aserpa's grandmother, which would be incredibly disturbing. But actually, they're going to decide that they don't see him, they want him to recover, do his thing, and eventually return to the 7th Division. However, as they leave, and it looks like Tanagaki is about to leave, he ends up getting shot with a bullet barely grazing across his forehead, and he realizes, oh shit, these guys are actually trying to kill me right now. So now it looks like Ogata is going to be hunting for Tanigaki himself. So what's the rundown on both of these episodes right here? I know that this review is all over the place and scatterbrain, but honestly, I only had a very small window to actually get this review and some of my thoughts out. What I will say is I loved these episodes for how incredibly wacky and insane they were. It didn't take long for this series to really start going over the top, and I love everything that they're doing with the characters thus far. Henmi is an interesting character in that he barely existed in the show at all, only for about the span of maybe a whole episode between the two but he left a massive impact on the series and again it demonstrated that this show is a great mixture of extreme comedy and also just intense violent action all at the same time there's some moments in this episode that are laughably violent and hilarious like I know that sounds kind of weird and contradicting but there's a great scene where Henmi is changing into some clothes and this old man is recovering in his building and sleeping and notices the tattoos so of course he has to kill him but while he's doing this he's actually talking to Sugimoto who's on the other side of a window. So they're having this full conversation while he's just murdering this guy and has a big smile on his face. It's in that moment that you truly understand what type of character he is, and it makes him very unpredictable and honestly really fun to watch. It also shows that a lot of the uh, Abashiri prisoners are all going to be very different in what they can actually do. Some of them are escape artists, some of them are massive hired muscle, some of them are really disgruntled samurai, and others are just crazy psychopathic serial killers. You never know what type of characters are going to pop up in the show, and it always manages to be really fun. It's also still one of the most atmospheric anime I've seen of the year, and it definitely is worth checking out. The production value is still a little rough around the edges, I'm not going to lie. The animation and the artwork is definitely nothing to write home about. This is a show that is saved by its atmosphere, its characters, and its really wacky over-the-top story, which started out so simple, just a story about trying to find some lost gold, 
and little by little has just started snowballing into one of the most intense wacky things that I've seen. I really am liking Golden Kamui, and even if the anime isn't perfect, it's introduced me to the franchise and desperately makes me want to check out the actual manga version. Also, I love how this episode also gave us some very subtle hints for the future of the series. We do get the fact that Hijikata actually does end up capturing uh, Shiraishi, and he desperately wants those tattoos. He's even willing to not kill him as long as they can actually get some copies of them. And at the end of the episode, he actually meets Sugimoto and a Serpa, and they don't even realize who this guy is. But he seems to know who a Serpa is, and even feels that she could be related to someone we might know in the series. Now, it's not very subtle or anything, but my personal theory is that this Noparabo, this guy who created all of these tattoos and the mysterious man who is in prison, could very well be a Serpa's father. I don't know how that is going to be the case, but I have a feeling it's going to happen. Especially when they actually do focus on that one creepy guy who's in the prison with the disfigured face. His eyes are very distinctive, and they put a lot of emphasis on a Serpa's eyes in this episode, and of course they do display a certain amount of personality, so there could be a connection here, and there could be a little bit more to this story about the uh, missing gold from Hokkaido. What I will say is, the series is incredibly engrossing, and definitely worth your time. I'm giving both of these episodes 4 out of 5, so I'm knocking them both down for the animation and the artwork, but still, like I said, it's made up for it for its really fun, over-the-top, and wacky story, which could be boring and cliche, but it's doing something unique that I've never seen from this style of genre. It's a crazy, wacky Japanese western, and you need to check it out. It's Golden Kamui. I'd love to hear your thoughts about both these episodes in the comment section below, and of course, what you'd like to see from the future of the franchise. Thank you guys for watching this review. I'll see you guys next time, and as always, stay down there, baby. Yeah.